good afternoon. This is a brief presentation of our project Top Dream, a project of the European Commission uh, based on uh, topology-driven methods for complex systems, uh, run by a consortium of which are part the University of Camerino, which is also the coordinator of the project, the ISI Foundation, uh, the University of Southern Denmark, the Open University, uh, the University of Aix-Marseille, and the University of Amsterdam. Uh, what I want to tell you briefly is a tale of what the project is, wants to be or is about, its philosophies, motivations, uh, and, and the uh, reach of the project, which uh, deals with the global vision of data. A global vision of data uh, as they come to us from uh, complex systems. Now, complex systems are one of the uh, most important frontiers of recent science. Uh, when we say complex, we mean not only complicated, but complex in the sense that it is uh, multi-level, multi-scale. Complex systems typically have a variety of scales in time and space. Uh, and above all, they are ubiquitous. They are ubiquitous because they are everywhere. They are everywhere in nature. And uh, of course, it, as it is natural, uh, the science of complex systems was born in the realm of natural sciences. But more recently, and more, I would say, dramatically, we uh, discovered that complex systems are also around us in our everyday life, because they are in internet, in our brain, in the climate, in the way in which pandemics spread out in the world, in economy and in finance. And we were badly affected by the disasters in finance to realize how important they are. In other words, they also belong to society at large. Now, the question that the Commission uh, posed to us, I would rather say the challenge, was the following. Does it make sense to think of a science of complex systems, a complexity science, uh, in a theoretical way, in the same way in which more than a hundred years ago uh, that phenomenology, phenomenological aspects of science, which is thermodynamics, was uh, systematized by statistical mechanics. Now, a comparison between the two disciplines makes quite evident how they are different and how much more difficult is to deal with complex systems than with thermodynamics. Because in thermodynamics, and when we construct statistical mechanics, which is the theory of thermodynamics, we have a number of assumptions which make our life relatively easier even though it took essentially 100 years to build statistical mechanics out of thermodynamics the, the way it is today. The assumptions are, uh, first of all, ergodicity, which is a mysterious word, essentially meaning that uh, every possible state 
that the system can reach in its dynamical evolution has the same probability of being realized than any other state. In other words, all states are equivalent, they are equiprobable. This is a property that uh, we find, and, and this is a, a, again a challenging question, in, in the way in which we consider numbers. Because irrational numbers have the same formal properties than that uh, ergodic systems have. Uh, in thermodynamics, we use the notion of what we call thermodynamic limit, which is a jargon expression to mean that the number of degrees of freedom, the number of actors involved in the game, which for physics or chemistry typically are particles, uh, is essentially infinite. Uh, it's not really infinite, it is a very large, very, very large number. The number of atoms that you have in a tiny fraction of matter or of liquid or solid or gas is of the order of the Avogadro number, uh, which is essentially 10 to the power 23, 10,000 billions of billions. So it's essentially infinite. Uh, moreover, when you deal with uh, statistical mechanics, you assume that all particles that you're dealing with are equal Equal meaning that not only an atom of, say, hydrogen is the same, is identical, actually indistinguishable uh, from any other hydrogen atom, but also that they interact with each other in the same manner, which is, which is more demanding. Also, Thermodynamics is a, is a scientific discipline in uh, all senses of the word. Uh, it is based on experiments, and, and it is the experiment that the uh, theory must explain, and the theory which does not explain the experiment, does not reproduce the results of the experiment, is falsified, uh, is, is declared false. Uh, and finally, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is describable in mathematical terms but by what we call uh, analytic functions, meaning it is described in ways in which the graphs or the, uh, of the functions that, pr that uh, reproduce the experiment are smooth functions, they don't have singularities. Uh, with an exception that we use to our advantage, when this, a singularity appears, we claim that there is a phase transition. The breaking of singularities is the appearance of phase transition. Now, we were able, we in a, in a general sense, uh, we were able to construct statistical mechanics, in other words, to produce a theory of thermodynamics because of these assumptions. Statistical mechanics is based on these uh, five features. Now, on the contrary, complex systems n do not have not even one of these features. To begin with, they are not ergodic. The states of a complex system coming from society, but also from uh, uh, science. Think of, uh, I don't know, the Genoma project. They are not equiprobable. There is nothing like ergodicity into play. The number of agents of a complex system is finite, is not infinite. It can be large, but it's never a, a, such a large number that you can consider it as infinite. The agents are not identical. Eh? Take, for example, finance. 
the agents in the financial system are not only not identical, but each of them has its own strategy. They can lie because of their strategies. They can be devious. They can, they are certainly not identical, not undistinguishable, and they interact with each other in different ways, depending on whether you are a friend or, or an enemy or, or whatever. Uh, complex systems are essentially never uh, representable by analytic functions. Uh, and at this point I will come back because possibly the functions are not even recursive. So they belong to a class of functions which are more difficult to deal with. And above all, they are not based on experiments, uh, but they're based on data. Uh, again, let me give you an example. If the complex systems you are considering is uh, Twitter, the, your, your data come from the uh, billions and billions of messages that people exchange on, on, on Twitter. Uh, of course you cannot ask all the users of Twitter, stop, st go back to the initial conditions, uh, redo uh, what we, you were doing. And, and so the, uh, there's no way to, not even a way to, to imagine an experiment uh, in the sense of uh, natural sciences. Now, Todrim concentrates on this last issue, uh, big data. The huge amount of data which is necessary to uh, uh, characterize a complex system and the ways in which we may try to extract information from this huge amount of data. Uh, let me tell you maybe a few numbers. <laughs> uh, in social systems, in systems which, have, which are coming from societal uh, uh, origin, the numbers are huge. People talk about a data tsunami nowadays. Uh, in, in, in 2012, last year, in the world, in one year, uh, people exchange 294 billion email messages and over 20 billion of uh, SMS on, on a mobile phone. And they posted uh, 20 million pictures on, on, on Facebook in a society in which, incidentally, uh, in, in one year, a billion cars is on the roads uh, and five billion people travel on, the, on planes, probably much less than five billion people, physical people, but, but the number of flights that they, they ha we have is... Uh, so big data is itself a complex discipline. And a very important one. I believe that the future is in the hands of big data. Uh, and it has a diverse, diversity of features because uh, there are big data in science and big data in society. And they are different. They are different because science collects data it is in, in its DNA to collect data. Science has always done that, collecting data and trying to interpret data and extract theories from data. Uh, but also science is affected by the big data uh, disease these days. Um, I give you only one number in this case. After the end, of the uh, Hubble mission, we have now a catalog of stellar objects 
a catalog means that we know the position, luminosity, spectrum, whatever of stars or stellar objects. They can be stars, they can be galaxies, they can be nebulae, whatever. We have a catalog in which, of course, there are no names for, the, for a reason which will be obvious immediately, because we have a catalog of, uh, let me tell it in the technical notation, and then I'll try to, to translate. It is 5 times 10 to the 21 uh, objects, uh, meaning, uh, what is it? Uh, is 5,000 billion of billions of stars, of stellar objects, uh, which is almost an Avogadro number of stars, which makes it more effective. Uh, and the same happens if you go, and, if you go to Geneva <laughs> and, and check with the scientists of CERN. They have data in the measure of exabytes, several hundreds of exabytes. Now, an exabyte is a number of bytes, uh, which is the equivalent of 4,000 times the content of the Library of Congress in Washington. The Library of Congress has 170 million volumes and the same number of maps, uh, manuscripts, and, and so on. Um, so there is a problem of big data in science, which is not what we are worried about, because if you study stellar objects, you have the laws of astrophysics, you have Einstein's relativity, you, you have ways of entering those data, you know what to look for. When you have data from society, uh, and this incidentally is the first time in which we have so many data on society. <laughs> the, up to a few years ago, sociology was uh, trying to uh, construct theories of society using typically a few thousand, a few thousand in the best cases, uh, data on, on the phenomenon they, they were studying. Today, as I was telling you, we have uh, billions and billions of, of data, and we can have real, we call it tomography of society, in a way which is not precedent, is, is a new way of looking at society. Um, a new way, for example, of looking at the way in which pandemias uh, propagate. Uh, in 1374, there was in Europe a plague which killed tens of millions of people. It started from uh, Siberia. Uh, it was propagated by rats and uh, I think it killed something like 50 million people in Europe. Now, that, the propagation of that disease, on which, curiously, we have a lot of information, a lot of data, uh, because of the church. Every parish had uh, registers with which would register the number of deaths, the number of sick people. Uh, the movement was very slow. It is easy to represent it in the same way in which you represent a, a wave propagating through, through water. When, suppose, imagine that you drop a, a, a drop of ink in a glass of water. You've done it probably, and you remember that there's this sort of figure, smooth, pr slowly propagating through, through the water. In 2011, when we had uh, H1N1, the uh, influenza, <laughs> uh, it was a single person who got sick in Hong Kong, 
because they had visited um, a, a poultry uh, a place where they were growing chicken, essentially, got infected, uh, took a plane in Hong Kong to Los Angeles. In the plane there were 500 people uh, who lived for 10 hours breathing the same air. The air in the airplanes is filtered, but not to the diameter of a virus. And when they arrived in, in Los Angeles, at least 300 of those 500 people were infected. And they boarded different planes, or took trains, or took buses. You can imagine the way in which this thing propagates explosively. Not only, but it is discrete in time and space. It's a real complex system. So big data have a variety of forms and features, but also have a variety of targets and strategies. For example, one main problem of big data, with which we don't have anything to do, is the hardware challenge. Our computers, all of you have a laptop, uh, your computer is able to deal with uh, gigabytes. As I told you, when, when you uh, talk about big data, you imagine a, a, an amount of information which is a billion times larger. Now, this implies, it's easy to understand what? Memories and power. Try and touch your laptop when you use it. It's hot. Because manipulating data uh, requires energy. Uh, imagine that to multiply the heat of your laptop a billion times. <laughs> you need, a, you need a, a, a nuclear power to just to feed your computer. Not to talk about the uh, uh, cooling system that it is necessary to carry away the heat and so on. So this is a big hardware question uh, which has to do with, with basic physics also. For example, uh, a few months ago, not many months ago, uh, in the IBM laboratories in Almadine, California, people were able to encode a single bit of information in a set of 12 atoms. Now your computer encodes a bit of information in 1200 atoms. Uh, so we are reaching the limit because below 12 uh, classical physics does not hold any longer. You need quantum physics. And also, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you go quantum, you, you have to face the necessity of changing entirely the way in which you deal with information. So, uh, when science is up to the challenge, we have now a discipline which is called quantum information, uh, which is our hope, but also our limit, because it's a, it's a tremendous conceptual challenge which has no solution yet. It, it has a solution on the uh, theoretical side, not on the practical side. Another aspect has nothing to do with hardware. We assume that uh, we have the necessary hardware, but then it has to do with the manipulation of big data. And here, uh, I, I don't want and I cannot enter uh, any detail, but again there is a, an exponential multiplication of the challenges that we have to face, because uh, most probably, when we really have to do with big data, 
we shall have to deal with problems of information manipulation, of data manipulation, which are, the jargon expression is beyond Turing, meaning that they cannot be faced or handled by the computers we have today. Nothing to do with the power, nothing to do with our previous step of the hardware. Um, it has to do with the fact that all our computers are based on a theoretical construct due to this uh, fantastic British mathematician Alan Turing. I usually say that Alan Turing was the person who won the Second World War because he was the essentially the inventor of Enigma, uh, which was the uh, the uh, cryptography device that helped the Allies to decipher the German secret codes. Uh, Turing has given us a conceptual scheme which reproduces all the uh, calculations that we can think of for a certain class of functions that are called recursive functions. I mentioned that before. Uh, we know, we already know, that there are problems in, uh, in the neurosciences which are non-Turing. Uh, we know exactly how to classify a problem in this respect. Uh, Turing had a student, a PhD student, called Gandhi. And Gandhi must have been a very clever person. Um, he said, well, Turing defines the class of functions for which his machine is allowing us to make calculations. The complement of this class is non-Turing, non-Turing computable. And he asked himself, how can I recognize whether a calculation that I'm approaching is Turing or non-Turing? And he gave five criteria <coughs> such that if even a single one of them is violated, then the calculation is non-Turing. And we know today, we know a number of problems. Most of them in big data, which are non-Turing. So the challenge is also in this sense. Uh, computer science has to reinvent itself to, to be able to face this, this, uh, this uh, uh, challenge. Uh, I'd like to mention one final remark. Uh, a byproduct of all of this is that we are probably witnessing a major revolution in, in, in ICT. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, big data may be the stimulus that turns ICT into a real big science. A, a science which permeates not only nature but, but also society. Uh, as for us, as for our point of view, uh, what is that we are, we are asked to do and we try to do? Well, what we try to do is to construct a theoretical framework allowing us to uh, enter this complex but crucial process of turning data, of which we have plenty, probably too much, <laughs> and extract from this data information, because the information is there, it's hidden in the data, uh, but it is there. And this is only the first step, because this further step is once you have extracted the information, 
aggregated information makes knowledge, uh, which is where we want to arrive. We want to construct knowledge out of data. And uh, I always add integrated knowledge is wisdom. And this is in particular necessary to, especially talking about uh, societal issues, this is particularly necessary to policy makers and decision makers, to those people who run our society. So, what we dream, in top dream, <laughs> uh, is to be able to find ways for taming big data in, in this process. And we claim that the tool to do so is coming from uh, topology. Topology is nothing but the, I would say, the geometry of shapes. It's that portion of geometry in which objects which have shapes which are similar in the sense that they can be deformed one, to, one into the other without traumas uh, are considered identical. Uh, now, w where do we start from? We start from uh, a notion which is coming from computer science uh, when computer science deals with data. And that is the notion of a space of data. Space of data is a somewhat abstract notion, if you want, but uh, just imagine that you live in a space, you live in our three-dimensional ambient space where we move every day. And this space you can easily imagine is made of points, several points, actually a continuum of points. Well, imagine a space in which every point is a datum. It's an abstract notion, but it's not difficult to, to imagine it. This is the structure, this gives you the structure in which information is encoded, because the information is encoded in data and hence it is encoded in this uh, uh, space. It is the frame for what we call uh, algorithmic thinking, digital thinking, because when we have these huge amounts of data, the ways in which you have to we have to think are, are different from the ways in which we have to think if we have the clean data of science. Uh, and it is also the the load where we have to perform data mining to extract information from this data. Now, how is this space of data? Space is a, a complex space, it's, it's a huge uh, complicated structure that I will not uh, described other than with these uh, metaphoric pictures. These pictures are simply representations. Uh, but uh, at this point I want to tell you with a metaphoric tale what is the uh, essence of Top Dream. Hmm? So this is the tale of Top Dream. <laughs> the tale goes like this. If you tell a physicist uh, try, try it, do the experiment. You tell a physicist, I give you a bunch of electric charges and currents all around. Well, uh, and you ask her, what can you do? And she will smile and say, oh, I have Maxwell's equations and they can compute in every point of space uh, the electromagnetic field and tell you there's an electric field and a magnetic field there of such and such intensity. 
Next question, a little, it, it looks similar, but it is actually a little more subtle. You tell a physicist, I give you a bunch of masses, what can you do? And again, she smiles and she says, oh, I have Einstein's equations, and I can compute in every point of space-time the geometry give you the curvature of space, give you the geometrical feature of space. Now, if you tell us, the top dreamers, uh, I give you a space of data, and you know that in every space of data uh, there's a bunch of hidden patterns, of hidden information encoded inside. What can you do? Well, <laughs> we smile <laughs> and we answer, uh, we don't have Maxwell's equations, we don't have Einstein's equations, nor any other type of equation, but we have topology. And perhaps with our topology we can tell you how to extract uh, faithful representations of that information from your space of data. So this is the dream of top dream. Find new ways of mining the space of data, of extracting information from the space of data, resorting to geometrical, mostly geometrical, topology is a branch of geometry, but all, also um, combinatorial, also geometrical in the classical sense, methods. How can we do this? Well, it all starts from uh, our bold <laughs> and courageous uh, extension of a set of ideas which was uh, was for the first time proposed by a number of mathematicians, um, Carlson, Edelsbrunner, Harer, and others, who were actually dealing with a different and slightly more easy, actually much easier problem. The problem of reproducing in a, by computer the shape of an object. Uh, we extend that set of ideas saying that topology is the tool that can allow us to handle la large, high dimensional, uh, complex spaces of, of data. Why? Why do we claim this? Well, uh, I'd be a little how can I say, boring now, but I, I have to go through these steps. Well, first of all, when you look at the space of data, you want to extract knowledge from that space. In other words, you want to understand how data is organized in there. What are the patterns connecting different parts of the space? what are the correlations of different parts of the, of the space. And you realize immediately that you have to content yourself with uh, qualitative uh, information, because the number of data is so large that if you want to do it quantitatively, quantitatively uh, it is simply too much, and you will spend the whole, your whole life uh, doing what, what the geographers of the Chinese Empire described by Borges do. The emperor wants a, a map which is more and more and more detailed and precise, and eventually the map covers the whole land, and it is a one-to-one -one, uh, representation of the land. We don't want to do that, so we need qualitative information. Also, 
this is a strange space because in every space like ours uh, if you consider two points you have a notion of a distance between two points in technical terms we say this saying that the space is metric now with physics uh, there are sound theoretical ways for providing a metric to our space but with data uh, there's no way hmm? uh, there's no natural notion of distance there's no natural notion of a metric not only that uh, in 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 the sciences, when you describe a space and want to differentiate points in a space, you give coordinates. You identify the point with a vector and you say, well, the, this, this point has a coordinate along the x-axis, which is such and such, the y-axis is such and such, the z-axis is such and such. This is what mathematicians call a vector space. Now data, uh, and this was a source of misunderstanding, actually of mistakes. Uh, data, it is true that data are given as strings of symbols, the same way as a vector. But the components of this vector have no meaning. Actually, the symbols can also be something which is not numbers. <laughs> but even if they are numbers, even if they are the easiest type of numbers we can deal with, the Boolean uh, Z2 field of numbers, 0 and 1, uh, the components of the vector that, re that describes a single datum have no meaning. And you should, uh, you should be very uh, critical if any property is given to you which depends on the component of those vectors. The space of data is not a vector space and the coordinates have no meaning. And finally, this is a little more subtle, uh, the conventional way to deal with uh, large amounts of data is to organize them in graphs. I'm sure you have seen pictures like this. This is a picture of internet. Every point in that picture is a server, is a, is, is, a, is a place where there is an internet connection and the links between points denote different nodes, different servers that communicate with each other. Uh, the conventional way to deal with complex systems is to construct graphs. The picture that I was showing to you of internet, that picture is a graph. Uh, and to extract information about the system uh, from that graph. Now that graph is interesting uh, for one reason. It tells you which point is connected to which, which are the uh, mutual connections that count. But so we can imagine to, to say in some way, in some way which depends on the graph that we have just seen, a point is more or less near to another point. Huh? Where near does not mean a length, a distance, but may be measured, for example, by the number of steps that you get, to, you need to go from one point to the other. Uh, However, we may have much more information if we keep a global representation of the space of data. Because if, 
if you do what I just told you, you sit on a node and you look around and see how many other nodes are connected to you, and then you move to one of those and look around and see which other nodes are connected with you and keep going. You will never understand how the space of data is organized globally. You will never understand whether you're sitting, as I usually say, on a sphere, on a plane, or in torus, on a surface with many holes. You simply don't. So we need to preserve summaries, global information. Other, other networks. Now, we claim, after this few considerations, we claim that topology is the right tool to deal with these systems. Again, why? Well, because topology is just a branch of mathematics which deals with qualitative geometry. Uh, topology considers is a branch of geometry, but it deals with those properties, geometrical properties, which are left invariant if you deform your object in an arbitrary way. Uh, there's, a, there's a joke, which is a very famous one, in which uh, the other mathematicians uh, tease the topologists saying, well, a topologist is a person who believes that when he, he, he has breakfast in the morning, believes that the cup in which he has poured coffee and the donut that he's eating are the same thing. The reason is the reason is uh, well, the donut is something like this. The cup is something like that. For a topologist, you can deform this into that in a continuous way. And there's one feature that remains in unchanged. There's a hole or if you prefer, there's a handle. This is a, a surface which has a hole. Topology study the existence of that hole. When we say topological features, we intend something uh, like this, which has to do with, it's easy to see that it has to do with quali qualitative information. We don't give any detailed description of this of that, because for us they belong to the same equivalence class. They're equivalent. Um, exactly for this reason, topology has nothing to do with metrics. There's no... We don't differentiate these two objects because of the metric. Because two points here or two points there are at a given distance or not. We simply don't care about the distance. Right? We care about the fact there is a hole. Um, so topology studies geometrical property which has nothing to do with metrics. Topology studies objects which have nothing to do with the uh, components of the vector. If you represent the points of those objects with vectors, the components have no meaning eh, whatsoever. So topology is the right uh, language. There is also a deeper question that I mentioned for completeness. is more a little more abstract, and I'm trying to keep my presentation at a very um, understandable level also for those who are not mathematicians or scientists. Um, I tell you 
these two objects for us are equivalent. And you see that it, I think all of you can imagine a process of continuous deformation of one object into the other. All you have to do is to preserve the whole. This process of deformation is what we call a map. Now, uh, maps between objects are the crucial elements of a part of mathematics, which is the most abstract, probably one of the most recent, probably most, one of the most difficult parts of modern mathematics. It is called category theory. And category theory tells us that uh, the invariance of uh, topology involve not only the objects but also the map between objects. And this is the reason why we are interested in this. Right? Because we are interested in all those properties which we can transform one to, into the other because this is the only way to gain information about our data. Uh, let me show to you an example. Uh, this is due to those friends I was mentioning. They, they use this approach to uh, reproduce objects with the computer. And if you want to reproduce an object which has a continuous point, of course you need to use a, a lesser number of points. And this is done by a technique which is called triangulation. In other words, you cover your object with uh, triangles. Uh, you select only a finite number of points on the object and then you connect these points with lines and make triangles. Uh, and uh, if you do it without thinking, you uh, obtain something which is useless. If you do it using uh, topology as your guiding tool, you get something which has the right number of holes and reproduces much more faithfully the, uh, the object you want to reproduce. Now let me be a little more technical for, for a second, uh, then I'll, I'll stop uh, giving you technical details. Uh, in Top Dream we do have a number of tools, some of which we developed ourselves, some of which we are planning to develop, some of which fortunately are known, and we could find in the literature. One of these latter is uh, what is called persistent homology. Let me simply mention that homology is a, is a part of topology and it is that part of topology which allows you easily to uh, discover which are the invariants. The analog, the analog of the whole here is an invariant because it is the thing that you want, don't want to change when you deform your, your system. Um, and in, in technical terms, uh, the way to, to uh, obtain all the invariants of a space is homology. And we have a technique whereby using this homology with, with changing the notion of nearness of two points, uh, we can say, as it was done in the picture that I was showing to you, you can say, well, this part of information is noise and this part is the real signal and you can concentrate on the real signal hidden in your data, on the part of, of your data which 
uh, encodes the true information. Uh, not only that, but we um, we do it uh, in a way which is the generalization of what people do with networks. I have shown to you examples of networks. Uh, and you probably noticed that in a network, typically, there were two nodes and the line connecting the two nodes. And you would say, oh, A and B communicate. They are in some way close to each other because there is a line connecting them. And that is all. The whole graph is done starting from this notion. You have two points and the line connecting the two points. What we do is something generalizing this. Suppose you have three points and you say A, B, C. And you say A communicates with B, but only if C is switched on. So you have a triangular relation. You have a surface, which is a triangle. And you can extend this. You can use four points, and you have a tetrahedron, A, B, C, and D. And there are mutual correlations uh, if and only if the four points collaborate to the process. Now, what this does is it provides us with a discrete way, discretized way, to represent the space of data. Uh, so our space of data is turned into one, into a, a global picture of this sort, but of which we are able to compute all the topological invariants. In other words, to extract all the information that is hidden there. Let me simply show to you a couple of examples. Uh, the points on the extreme left up corner are the, our data. We describe, we give a notion of nearness, which is done in the right side of the upper part. And out of that, we construct our discretized form. And we see whether there are holes or not. Let me also give you, a, a, how can I say, a chauvinistic interlude. <laughs> All of this is due to an Italian mathematician. Name is Enrico Betti. And the way in which descri we describe all of this is through a set of numbers which are called Betty numbers. And Betty is this wonderful uh, person there with a white beard, as it was at the old times <laughs> in the academy. Now, um, applications. I gave you, so far I gave you the tale of how Top Dream was born. And I gave you the tools, how and why Top Dream is, is powerful. It has a lot of power because it has this conceptual tool of topology, which is the top <laughs> part of, uh, of the title of the project, um, of the acronym of the project. Uh, you may ask yourself, yes, but this is somewhat abstract to you. Uh, are you thinking about applications? The answer is, of course, we do. Uh, our project has a conceptual, theoretical part, which is very hard, very abstract, very difficult. I told that at the very beginning. It's a very ambitious project, believe me. But it also has interesting applications, some of which were already completed successfully, giving 
unexpected result, uh, very important. The brain. Uh, we were able to show that some of the functions of the brain can be extracted from the MRI image of the brain. Uh, the immune system. We generated a, a new model of the, new, the immune system which generalizes in, in a dramatic way what was used up to now to, to model the immune system exactly for the reason that I was explaining to you. The model is built in such a way as to produce data consistent with the topology of the data space. In other words, in this case, instead of starting from the data and extracting a model, we generalized known models to uh, cope with the way in which data are, are, are given. And again, um, the philosophy is very simple, because in all known models, also very effective, of the immune system, it's always antigen I acting or interacting with antigen B. Uh, and we say, well, no, in the process you can have situations in which, in which antigen A interacts with antigen B if and only if antigen C is active. And again, generalize. Uh, RNA combinatorics. Uh, you know the RNA is the basic, one of the basic bricks of, of living matter. And it is so because it is able to reproduce itself, to replicate itself. It duplicates. You have a molecule which is a very complex molecule which is able to in some way make or, or, or force the matter outside itself to make a copy of itself. Uh, how can it do it? Well, there are ways to approach in the different ways to approach this problem. One is more fundamental. You may ask yourself, what is the physics? of this process, but this is a way which is purely based on data, on the information we have, and the correlation of data. And again, it turns out that topology is what plays the crucial role, and in this case, um, the combinatorics, the all different ways in which parts of the molecule can combine, is, is what gives it was encode it, it is what encodes the relevant uh, information uh, and then we have the problem of communi communication among biomolecules which apparently again starting from data appears to violate uh, the usual rule rules of interacting molecules. There is something more uh, mysterious that is certainly encoded in the data. Biomolecules can communicate at a distance. Hmm? Uh, this is in a way not surprising because if you think for a moment about it, what is it that makes a biomolecule different from a molecule? Hmm? When do you attach the prefix bio to a molecule. Well, easy. Bio means living, when the molecule is living. But what is it that differentiates a living molecule from a, an inert molecule? Well, a living molecule encodes a message that an inert molecule does not. So, a way to characterize life is to say living object is made of 
molecules able to encode the information and to manipulate information. And then uh, the dynamics of complex networks. I was telling you the example of uh, H1N1, the, the pandemics. Uh, that's a typical case that you cannot describe with a single network. Because it is true, you have a network of people getting the contagion. So there's a network in which you put a link between a person who, is, who is, has the virus and gets close to another person and the other person is con uh, gets, gets the virus by contagion. Uh, but when you want to describe the phenomenon, when, especially when you want to make predictions about how the pandemics will expand, uh, you don't have a single network of that sort, because you have the network of uh, air, air, airplane uh, uh, connections, you have the network of trains, you have the network of buses taking children to school. All of these are places where the contagion can take place. And you need this structure, again it's a topological structure, a very complex one also for topology, <laughs> uh, which is a network of networks, uh, a network every element of which is itself a network. Uh, they are called hypernetwork. Uh, and finally, there are questions from language theory. Uh, one basic feature of our approach is that it is global versus local. Now let me give you not any technical detail because this is would bring us in a very esoteric <laughs> domain, uh, but um, you all know that time is flowing in one direction, right? For us, because we are complex systems, time is flowing in one direction. We know exactly that we are getting older because time flows in one direction and not backward. But if you describe yourself with the laws of physics, be it classical mechanics of quantum mechanics or chemistry or whatever, these laws are, we say in technical jargon again, a time reversal invariant, meaning that the laws of dynamics, the laws of motion, the way in which the system evolved, are the same if time goes one direction or the, the other. If you inverted the direction of time, like a movie, uh, well, probably films are no longer used, but you, you all know what the film was. If you take a movie and instead of rolling the film in a direction, you roll it backward, you see the movie going backward and the time going backward. This system is time reversal invariant. But every day's life is not. Why? Because life is a complex system. And why, how do we realize that? Well, because entropy increases. The evolution of time, physicists call it the time arrow. The time arrow, the direction in which time evolves, is the direction in which entropy increases. In our universe, entropy is an ever-increasing function, and time flows that way. Uh, now, <laughs> I made it a long, a short story long, but in, in the theory of formal languages, there are questions which are very similar to this question. They have to do with reversibility. And only if you deal with a global vision of the problem, 
And if you deal with the vision of the problem, which includes the complexity of the system, the interaction among all the components, on a global level, n never at local level. Uh, in these things, what happens locally is irrelevant. If you sit here, what happens in all the points there, or here, what happens in all the points there, does not change. You can deform that region arbitrarily, and do, you don't change the real feature of the system. In these questions, the true keyword, magic word, is global. Uh, we need to study global uh, properties. Uh, and there are ways in which the theory that we are elaborating could lead us to understand uh, properties of languages. For example, could lead us to uh, give a rationale for uh, the classification of grammars and languages that uh, Noam Chomsky gave us. Uh, because it has to do with, with the way in which, in a language, you encode or decode uh, information. The future. To understand when, where we are planning to go in the future, you should first understand our open boundary vision. We top dreamers are people who believe that uh, we are representing a sort of science which cannot allow any constraint. We need to be free to break the boundaries, the boundaries between disciplines. Uh, to our collaborators, we don't ask, are you a mathematician, a biologist, a physicist, a computer scientist, or a neuroscientist? They simply have to understand all and to be scientists in all these fields together. Otherwise, uh, the boundaries in between would break the communication in a crucial uh, and, and little way. So first of all, we are open boundary people. Second, we are standing on the shoulders of uh, unbelievable scientists. Uh, I, I should have written a long list, but let me mention, as I did, uh, Poincaré, Kolmogorov, Shannon, uh, and more recently Feynman, Turing, of whom I already spoke, Gödel. But also more recently, uh, Vinton Cerf, uh, Phil Anderson, Geoffrey West, people who understood two things. One is that the real challenge of the science of uh, the next century, some of my colleagues say millennium, but this is probably too much, of the next century, is sitting in big data. Uh, and that the real challenge is to devise a way to deal with big data, which is a science, which uses the methods, the methodology, the tools of, of science. So, uh, if you want, our dream with an eye <laughs> is to eventually construct what I said we are missing. I say, telling you the tale of Top Dream, I told you, well, we don't have equations. We don't have Maxwell's equations. We don't have Einstein's equations. Well, we would like to have those equations and to be those who write this equation. Uh, let me tell you what would happen if we did. Uh, using the social sciences as an example. In the social sciences, uh, 
social scientists collect data and they do statistics. They would tell you the population is of Camerino is, I mean, 55% male and 45% females or vice versa. Uh, but when you collect data in that way, it's like taking a photograph of society. And like every photograph, the moment you take a photograph is of something, you consign that something to the past. Because whatever you take a picture of is evolving is a dynamical object. With our field theory of data, assuming that we eventually are able to construct it, we shall have a camera able to see, to photograph the dynamics, not only the static picture, but a mathematician who say the derivatives. Uh, and I would say the way it evolves in such a way as to be able to make predictions. Our field theory should allow us to make reliable predictions on what? All I listed at the beginning, weather, internet, climate changes, pandemics, uh, and so on. Um, it's like the real dream of Top Dream is, comes from Leonardo. You know that one of the most difficult, open, possibly unsolvable problems of theoretical physics has to do with turbulence, describing the motion of a fluid uh, in its turbulent regime. Leonardo was able to to catch it with its drawings. Uh, and we hope to be able to do with Leonardo what, what Leonardo did. This is a drawing of Leonardo. This is a picture in the lab of a turbulent motion. Leonardo, looking at water, was able to catch what was going on inside at that level of complexity. This is our dream.